So thanks everyone for coming. Um, my name is Ed Vilmedi. I'm from Packet. Um, this is a talk about Packet and uh, Qualcomm and Mesos, uh, a window into the development of the ARM V8 ecosystem. Let's see. And I need to make sure I get the next slide. Okay, good. So the th theme is loose loosely around uh, Lord of the Rings, because you need a theme for a talk. Um, all's well that ends better. So um, I've been working on uh, getting software in general to work as well as it possibly can on ARM systems uh, since I got my f uh, first uh, demo account at Packet last October. Um, and uh, started working for them uh, as a consultant in January and full-time in May. Uh, we announced this week uh, a partnership with Arm Holdings to even expand that out. Oh. And I'm missing a control here. There we go. So who am I? Um, I'm special projects director at Packet. Um, special projects director means you can do whatever you want as long as you get someone to convince that it's working really well. Um, I run the Works on ARM project for them. Uh, so the goal of the project is to get every bit of software that anyone would ever want to run to run uh, as well or better on ARM as it does on any other system. I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, I've been online since the 1980s. That's me in 1987 after the Morris, 1988 after the Morris Worm hit, uh, doing a TV interview. Um, that's an Apollo workstation. If anyone is rem can can go back far enough in time, that I think it's somewhere on YouTube. Yeah, I, I had someone digitize it, but. Uh, uh, a friend of mine annotated it with the Raptor, uh, with the Raptor uh, notations there. So I've been doing this for a long time, long enough to remember that the world didn't always used to be Intel processors, um, long enough to remember that when the new hot workstation came out, you had to do a bunch of work to port things to it, uh, long enough ago to remember when we were running uh, Linux on Intel back in the 90s, um, and it was on cheap little machines. You know, the lowest end, the cheapest way to do it uh, just barely worked. So I've seen the evolution of new architectures before. And when, um, when I found uh, the ARM ecosystem through the Raspberry Pi, I uh, realized that there was something really new and special there and, and possible. And a little bit about Packet. So I work for Packet. Um, Packet's based in New York City. Um, it's a bare metal cloud aimed for developers. Um, we offer hardware uh, that you can access through APIs or through uh, um, provisioning tools like Ansible and Terraform. Um, it feels for all the world like a cloud. You know, it has the same kind of behavior as cloud computing, but it from a hardware standpoint, it's sort of more like co-location. And uh, we offer servers by the hour and by the month, uh, about 10,000 users, about 50,000 deploys a month um, under eight minutes, uh, both x86 hardware and a bunch of configurations, and ARM hardware, and AMD hardware coming soon, although that's, that was news to me when it got added to this slide. Um, we're agnostic about what you do with this once you get turned up, once things get turned up. Um, but we're really all about empowering people to, to build things, um, especially to build things um, on bare metal. Uh, so we give, access to, we give access to infrastructure that lets people um, do things like develop hypervisors and do fundamental infrastructure without a lot of intervening um, software in the way that we would run. So a little bit about this talk, um, I'll just sort of frame it for you. 
Um, I want to talk a little about why hardware matters in an age of virtual machines. Um, I want to go through uh, how one brings up a new system and the sort of layer upon layer upon layer of stuff that needs to be done. Um, and why this path through the system is different this time through uh, because of the increasingly interesting nature of hardware. Um, I have a very small demo that I did in advance uh, that I can show you a little bit about DCOS Unpacket that sets the stage for why someone would want to do things on bare metal. Um, and then I have uh, 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 some hardware to show you, and uh, uh, so let's let's get into this. Why does it matter? So, when someone who doesn't know a lot about the current state of the ARM hardware world thinks about ARM, their first thought is usually embedded. They're thinking about very small machines. They might have touched or used or had their nephew or cousin or whatever had a Raspberry Pi. There's this perception. Uh, among some people that uh, uh, ARM is embedded systems. And that was true for a long time, and, uh, and it increasingly is not the only answer. So hardware is where innovation is happening at a pace that's really distinct from how software is innovating. Um, we've gotten really good at doing gen generic workloads, uh, DevOps, has meant that the things that used to take a lot of people a lot of time to manage by hand um, have gotten much simpler. And because the labor to manage uh, 100 machines has gone way down, we've been able to take on bigger and bigger compute tasks. Um, but you can only do so much with the abstraction of a virtual machine, um, and in particular, uh, new hardware that's tuned to the software task that it's aimed at, or software that uses all of the capabilities of the chip that it's, that's running on, um, offers um, enormous potential performance improvements over the generic CPUs that have characterized most kinds of um, most kinds of data center workloads. Um, in particular, think about the mobile industry. Um, Apple's new iPhone, uh, this is bits of their core. Um, in addition to the CPU in the new Apple hardware, there's specialized image processing capability. Um, there's a custom GPU that they have. And this accelerates their ability to serve the needs of the mobile phone user well beyond what you would have if you just had ordinary compute power. And the, the full expectation that I have is that we will increasingly see um, specialized compute um, showing up in data centers, not as easy to consume as an abstract virtual machine, but where your application fits it perfectly, having uh, substantial opportunities to continue the, on the performance thing. Other things that could get really, that could get really, let me turn this down a little bit. Other things that could get really big and special, um, we've seen, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, having a substantial opportunity to engage um, with lots of data and lots of compute power. Um, autonomous vehicles have an enormous st stream of data flowing off of them that has a chance of, of uh, changing things, both on the scale size as well as the special size. Um, gaming, um, the whole internet of things where you have sensors spewing out data from devices ar around things. Um, and then in the telco world, the conversion of specialized telco infrastructure into something which, is get, which gets called NFE or network function virtualization, where there's an opportunity to turn on, turn on its head how people, um, how telcos uh, provide services to their users. So there's a bunch of essentially new applications, 
um, more, you know, well beyond the serve another web page piece of the world. Um, and this all, these all give an, uh, a motivation for considering other, other hardware. So this is Google's ten, a side view of Google's TensorFlow. Um, this is a hardware from Microsoft uh, that they have in Azure. Again, um, tailor-made to particular applications. Um, and then uh, with, with those two pictures of pretty hardware, um, this is Qualcomm's 48-core um, ARM server that I happen to have uh, with me. And uh, I'll, I could pass this around if people don't spill their soda on it to take a look. Um, it's, a, it's a piece of hardware that's in some sense very ordinary in the sense that it looks like a server and if you plug it into the right sort of rack it's exactly what you'd expect to go into a data center. Um, but also um, it's very special in the sense that it has uh, 48 cores, which is more than the ordinary server of the same size. Um, you know, plenty of memory and an ARM chipset in it. So to make it work, um, you are motivated by the fact that it has a very dense core count and you're motivated by novelty, right? Because new things uh, provide new opportunities. So I want to do just a super brief, um, uh, pick another window here, see if I get the right thing. So Qualcomm and Packet have been working together to get access to that hardware to, um, to people uh, who are doing software development. Um, Qualcomm it has a very large history of doing mobile development, but that has given them a deep experience in ARM development. Um, Packet um, has uh, a use model that allows uh, people to get access to bare metal so we don't have to provide a hypervisor. We're not giving, we're not assuming that we know what you want to do with it. Uh, we, we provide that, we provide that for you. Uh, the chip on this device is a Centrique 2400 um, with up to 48 cores in it. Um, the architecture is based on ARM V8. It's a 64-bit only system, so uh, that's uh, suitable for data center workloads. Um, the structure is that it has a number of pairs of custom cores that are uh, arranged in a system bus ring interconnect. Um, this gives a substantial amount of bandwidth inside the chip. Um, and there's a number of optimizations so that uh, instructions um, can be done out of order uh, to improve performance as well. So it's, I, like I say, it's one of these things that when I first ran into it, you say, huh, that's different from all the other things that I've worked on in the past. Um, the, the opportunity is there, if you can make use of it, to potentially um, gain a performance advantage or at the very least um, uh, have some alternatives in the data center so that you can move your workload wherever it's most appropriate. So I'll pull that back. Um, so if you have new hardware, there's a certain, for lack of a better word, layer cake of things that all have to work before your brand new hardware becomes a boring routine uh, part of your data center. Um, and th there is, plenty of time to talk about this over the course of uh, many beers. Um, but it starts at the boot firmware. So uh, if, you're, if you're providing bare metal access to, to hardware, um, the system has to boot. And you'd be surprised how few people in the software world 
really understand the firmware. Um, thanks. Really understand the the how. Thank you. How the particular chips, the the uh, BMC chip, and how IPMI works, and a bunch of things that like never register on on people's radar as being important. Yet, if you're going to automate access to this hardware, all that stuff has to be right. So the first couple weeks of our access to a new hardware is just booting the machine over and over again, getting it rigged into our system. Um, once the firmware is running, you have to get a, a kernel. Um, with all new hardware, there's almost always new kernel patches that have to be incorporated. Um, fortunately for us, uh, Qualcomm and Cavium, who we always also work with, have been very good about mainstreaming their kernel changes. Um, but you have to be ready to run the latest and greatest and not, um, not old things. Um, we keep pace with operating system developments. Um, again, nearly always running the latest versions of um, things like Ubuntu and Debian, uh, CentOS, and Red Hat Linux. Uh, and working very closely with those operating system developers to make sure that their system boots cleanly and nicely and neatly um, on these systems. We're not even yet at applications, right? All the languages that you have have to work. They have to work really well. They need to have libraries that incorporate all of the hardware instructions that your chip runs. Um, so, and, uh, oh, I lost it. And uh, keep, keep going up the stack, right? So there's just, there's a lot of work to be done. I don't want to minimize how hard it is to have a brand new system be boring, right? So boring that you don't know when you're typing in front of it, whether it's an Intel system or an ARM system, um, where Everything works just as expected, where there's no surprises. Um, and as we look at bringing DCOS to ARM, um, each of these levels of the, of the stack have to have some attention in some order. Now, I've been working on the languages and libraries front um, for a long time. That was like the first thing. It's like, compile all the compilers. How well do the compilers work? Do they work all the time? Are there any bugs? Do the people working on them know that ARM is a target? Um, the containers world uh, has been interesting because uh, there was just an announcement this week at Docker of native support for multi-architecture containers um, so that you can run a single container and the system will automatically figure out what architecture you're on and load the right image for it. Um, that was like two and a half years in the making to get that amount of effort done. Um, so, you know, a lot of work, right? Um, this journey is a little bit different because a lot of that work has been done. Um, software has accelerated, so things like DCOS, Kubernetes, and Docker um, are in mass adoption. We're not talking small amounts of people, we're talking large numbers of people. And software developers, whether they're doing web development or whatnot, um, are, are coming in this world at an increasing, what seems to me to be an increasing pace, automating everything, making everything easy to do, um, removing the uncertainty, removing the grief from running a big system. Um, for better or for worse, software moves faster than hardware. Um, high, level, high level components have been polished. Um, things like boot firmware, there's just not that many people working on boot firmware. It's not exciting, it's not shiny. Um, I think we know all of them from the, from the course of working with, with the various vendors we work with. There's a tiny, there's a, you know, a handful of pieces of code. They're not moving very fast and we depend on them utterly to do what we're doing. So we're not really, as an industry, all that well tooled to deal with diverse hardware. Um, we don't know as much from a cultural standpoint of how to deploy and secure it. Um, 
it's rare to get a full stack engineer who goes all the way down to the firmware or the chip design. Um, much more when people say they're a full stack engineer, they know both front end and back end and operating system, but getting all the way through down the kernel to the driver level and then to the firmware that enables that drivers, that's like uh, unicorns trying to find those people. Um, so it's a, it's a challenge and it doesn't get easier because people are consuming hardware increasingly uh, as abstractions in the cloud. Um, the only sort of counterpoint to this that I would say is, fortunately, there's a robust market of single board computers, people experimenting with things like a Raspberry Pi, where there's uh, hands-on access to enough control software so that people can, can do things. But that's, you know, I, I would love it if that was the trend, and I, I hope it is, but there's really not a store that you can walk down the street to and buy a stack of, of, of hardware, which just doesn't exist anymore. Um, so uh, I was encouraged to invoke the demo gods um, just to prove that I knew at least a little bit about what was going on, and uh, I realized that um, automating access to hardware means that sometimes things that take a long time are not suitable for demos. So I want to, you to look at the screen on the right-hand side. Um, it took about mm, 20 minutes to bring up a DCOS cluster on Intel on Packet. And just to prove that I did that, um, no, this is not the commercial part. This is the he knows a little bit about his stuff part. Um, so we were able to, I was able to get it up uh, uh, a couple false starts. I worked with our team to make sure that I could do, that I could get this thing up. It's not really running anything, so it's not very impressive as a, it's not a proof of deep knowledge, it's a proof of work. Um, but if you look at the difficulty of bringing up, and this is not running on ARM, this is running on Intel. So if you, if you want to get a sort of degree of difficulty question, it's like, well, how hard would it be to port DCOS to ARM, you can take it from a couple levels, right? Do we have the fundamental automation? Yes, so I have a target. I say, if I'm gonna do this, it's not gonna be a proof of concept that takes a week to install. If it's done right, it's a 15 minute start to finish or a 20 minute start to finish operation. That's our goal. But to get it running, look at all these components that are supported. So I need to have uh, I need to have a Kafka story. I need to have a Jenkins story. I need to have Spark running. Um, there's a bunch of community packages that people rely on all the time. So a port of DCOS to ARM really means like porting all the things, right? There's no, there's no, um, you could, you, you wanna get a start on it, but to be convincing, you really wanna say, well, I, you know, I wouldn't know what I was, what hardware I was running on if I double clicked on InfluxDB. It would be like whatever the best system f would be for that. And um, I don't want to minimize it. That, that's a lot of work. Um, fortunately, it's work that can be done in parallel. So a number of these systems um, are already, um, have already had ports started to ARM. Um, some of them are, are completely done. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, a certain amount of work, not, not, so that system is running on packets infrastructure. Um, you maybe can see that it has four nodes running uh, under container Linux and Sunnyvale, and that's the, that's the real thing behind it. Um, so, so DCOS on packet, how, do, how did I do a 20 minute, well I didn't do a 20 minute demo, but I showed you that I had, I had done it. Um, how do we do it? Um, we use Terraform to deploy nodes. Um, on Intel it just works. Um, it, it, we've, we've automated all the bring up process. I don't need to know a lot about the system to have it run. Um, unfortunately, oops, DCOS doesn't work on ARM yet, right? So. I'm not showing you this board with DCOS. What I'm motivating is, hey, 
uh, it's an interesting enough piece of hardware. It's an attainable goal. Um, uh, due to the work of many, it's inches away. And what Packet has done uh, with ARMS cooperation is provide um, my time to help do community management and wrangling of this ecosystem. Um, I put out a newsletter every week with news of, of what's going on so that people can find each other and make connections. Um, give people access to the hardware so that they can log in themselves and, and do all the ports and run all the tests. Um, make sure that fixes uh, make, it, make their way all the way upstream um, so that instead of fixing it once and doing a demo, you fix it forever and get it installed and uh, get it to be part of the system. So what needs to be done? So um, the Works on ARM project has really solid funding for a year. So it's like, what am I going to do this year? Um, of course, I hope it lasts longer, but it shouldn't last too long. At some point, you, you give up and declare victory. So for, for all projects, the path is as follows. Um, you identify the contributors to the system, uh, who the maintainers are, uh, make friends with the community managers, which is usually easy because they're usually quite friendly. Um, try it out yourself. So one of the things that I did before coming here is like, all right, let's try to get Mises running on ARM. And the answer was, well, most of it compiles except for a library from Google called Glog or Glog, and it's an old version, and it doesn't know what an ARM processor is because the code in the distribution is from 2007. So that wasn't a complete stopping point, uh, but it's an in indicative of, of, of what, what things are. So I opened up some bug reports, you know, start the process of engaging with the community, I've done this sort of work uh, of bring up work in a bunch of communities. So work with the Go language community, work with the Node community, work with the, work with the Docker community and the Kubernetes community, find the people who are working on it, find the people who care, find the people who are interested, uh, open up the bug report, start tracking issues. And what you end up with is, is this very um, wide pipeline of progress. Um, at any moment, things seem to be taking a long time, but you've queued up enough things in parallel that something good and new happens every day, and you get these small wins that you can build off of and, um, and do that. It's always important to contribute patches to these projects, and crucially, you have to upstream all the things. There is no way to make this work unless every bit of work you do is destined for upstream. Um, and this is actually, so people in the kernel world have learned this. Um, it's very rare to see a hardware manufacturer in the single board computer world not try to get all of their patches upstream because they know that people have a very low tolerance for forks. Uh, they have a very low tolerance for having to hive off on their own and figure something out. Um, in the in the ARM world, there are some vendors that are more uh, comfortable working upstream than others, let's just say. Um, uh, kernel work is different from application level work. Um, often there is some hesitancy to admit that things are not perfect. Um, I'm not shy about telling people that they have a bug and sharing the bug report because I think that's part of my job. But, you know, the. I, I want to really get from a point of it worked for me once or I was able to do it at a hackathon or I did it in the lab t to figure out all of the changes that needed to be made and engage in the potentially slow process of going through and getting community buy-in and understanding the risks and understanding how you can get a... Um, get a system to change over time. Um, like I say, the, the crucial change in uh, the Docker community was multi-architecture support. Um, that was about a two-year process from initial architecture uh, description to, to final. It's almost final right now. So, <coughs> so the call to action. Um, 
Hardware is an innovation layer. New hardware means we can approach new problems um, and uh, solve things uh, you know, five to 500 times as fast if our hardware exactly matches our problem. Um, the work of developing new ecosystems uh, is worthwhile, is a worthwhile endeavor. Um, the fact that you can engage with people who are on, have a common task is a, is a noble cause. Um, it's likely to be uh, a more common task across the industry as more specialized hardware gets, in, gets into things. Um, for instance, uh, GPUs would be another good example of uh, a system where hardware gives you a, a, a substantial advantage and uh, you know, actively looking at all of this new hardware coming online and like how do you consume it in a way that's easy. Um, so uh, the, the call to action is um, come hack on hardware with us. Uh, we have equipment coming online, uh, Qualcomm systems, Cavium systems, systems from other vendors. We're, I'm working with people literally around the globe to uh, port workloads to ARM and to, and to fix bugs and to engage with folks. And, um, and uh, a year from now, I should be giving the talk about how it all just works, right? How it's boring, um, how it's indistinguishable from, from uh, DCOS on any other hardware. So the, the pitch is um, come explore the works on arm. Uh, works on arm .com is the uh, is the website um, we launched. We relaunched that this week. It's my uh, community site to keep track of things. A sort of a catalog of ships of all of the logos of things that we know have a good a good good behavior uh, on arm and some that are in progress and need uh, need love. Um, I produce a newsletter every week, uh, Friday at noon Eastern time, um, and uh, send that out to a list which is growing. Um, if you want a login, if you want a, a whole machine like this to use for your efforts, um, contact me. Um, we have uh, a process of working with Qualcomm. The, the hardware is currently under NDA, so uh, you where it gets metered out fairly slowly, but um, as they get closer to, to going to market, it'll be easier. Um, and you can reach me um, on, I'm not the only Vilmedi in the world. If you can type that successfully, you can find me on any network, um, or you'll find my brother. Um, Packet Host is our uh, handle. Um, the logo on the left is the Packet, packet Bot logo. The logo on the right is the Works on Arm logo. Um, and um, uh, with that, I'll step down and take any questions. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah, there's a there's a spot for a TPM here, and yeah, that's a really good question. You have access to the you you will have uh, you know root level access to the hardware. Um, I think that's possible, but why don't you drop me a note and I'll. No, no, it's it's all bare metal, and you get you get the whole thing. So. If your hypervisor can engage the trust zone, um, you can make it work. So uh, the question is, what am I tr trying to get working on ARM? The, um, the works on ARM project to date um, the first thing is get all the operating systems running. So engage with people who have gotten, who are doing distributions and who've gotten tens of thousands of packages to work. So Ubuntu, Debian, uh, CentOS, Fedora, Red Hat. I mean, it's, it's worth saying that Linux has been on for, for years. years. Right. Ubuntu has been compiling for Debian's been compiled on 
for years, for, right. So there's, there's a baseline of, of, of operating systems. Um, compilers is sort of the next frontier. They all just tend to generally work. The challenge is optimization in some cases where if you use the hardware instructions correctly, you get you know, order of magnitude performance improvements. Um, there's a certain amount of algorithm development that goes on in parallel with that, finding algorithms that work really well with this hardware so that you can do a hashing algorithm or something like that. And um, so at the edge, there's people who know the Intel instruction set deeply and the ARM instruction set deeply and are inventing things that work really well you know, from the start on both sorts of systems. Bob, did you have a question? Yeah. The question is about um, other sorts of things that you might do, like FPGAs. Um, at Packet, we have that sort of stuff on our radar, but the question from a service provider perspective is if you have an FPGA that you give to one customer and they're done with it, you need to undo everything that they've done and give it to the next customer. That's hard. That's hard. I mean, that's sort of fundamentally hard. Um, Right. It's, uh, so there's a, a startup in the UK called Reconfigure.io who are doing um, a Go compiler, Go to FPGA, so that you can write code for FPGAs and have it compile and run directly in AWS machines with FPGAs. Right. But that's definitely where we're going. Is a, you know, it's um, code processing and, and more specialized algorithms. Right. Right. And the, which is a part of the same problem of like. Yeah. Years ago, Paul. when I was working at Motorola and Phoenix on AT&T System 5, and I was doing a custom port for them, AT&T had what they called the SVBL System 5 application suite, which was just a gauntlet test of the requirement for a library of the utilities, and it would take the 88K processor two days to run the hardware. Right. You talk about going in and tweaking algorithms and doing this and doing that to exploit the hardware, but what do you do to, have a, to verify you get the same results on Right. Is there a verification suite for these Linux systems? So the question is, if, if you're doing custom development and making changes to exploit the hardware, um, how, do you ver how do you verify that you get the good results or the same results? So the answer to that is not one verification suite because the world has gotten a lot bigger. It's for uh, essentially the larger the project, the more likely that they have some level of test-driven development to support their uh, CI system. I mean, I'm modest. I mean, I'm just looking at current and library. Because those two things, if I cannot optimize those, I can get You can get everything at. Anything else would be faster. Is there, are there good verification suites just at that level? Um, there's good verification suites. So let's see. Um, good being hours of work that all has to go correctly. Or, or minutes of work if it's a super fast machine. Uh, good being thousands of tests. Uh, good being tests that test against specific regressions and whatnot. It's variable. Some systems are better than others at testing. But, but, but packages, are packages are available. Yeah, so the, the, the challenge of the next 12 months for me is um, continuous integration. Um, making sure that as packages say that they have been ported to ARM and have successfully gotten something running, um, going to the point where you could, from there, um, every time someone checks in new code, run the, whole re run the whole regression suite, make sure that nothing is broken. If someone has a new bug, you add a new test to test for that new bug. And um, that's sort of more so there are some systems that are hard to do that on, right? Testing distributed systems is intensely difficult. Um, but certainly languages and libraries are attainable. And I've seen. A lot of the optimization stuff is actually in the compilers. And ARM themselves are, are, are actually putting a lot of effort into um, compiler optimization. Right. Some ways, you know, downstream, 
you're going to get that by default through the compiler. You know, the functional so testing of things is... You don't have to do as much yourself. You don't have to... Uh, and right. It's much more lower level, really, than for most software packages, you know, because it's, uh, they're abstracted away by, uh, by our own code. Sure. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I have occasionally seen cases where a mathematical result on ARM will give a different one from Intel, and you file a bug report, and you sort of dive into the algorithms to make sure that the libraries are doing the right thing. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's actually, you're actually using all those instructions and, and working your way up the stack from the fundamentals up to, you know, up to higher level things. The other thing you have to do is continuous performance evaluation, where you make a change and did you have a regression on various tests and can you get forward progress and is it forward progress on all the architectures? Because you don't want to do something on ARM that makes the Intel system slower, that's, that's a failure, right? So. So what ARM is bringing is um, high core density, um, lots and lots of cores for the same, on, on the same you know, die size and comparable power consumption, more cores than, than alternative systems. So if your workload is by its nature really parallel because it's I.O. bound rather than CPU bound or you have a lot of threads that you need to run, um, it, that those systems tend to have much higher core counts for the same price performance envelope. Um, and that's valuable in some workloads and less valuable in others. So. With that, I will thank you. Um, look forward to having.